Welcome back to the Telosive EV Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, I am joined again with Rivian Shirt Mike. How are you today? I'm doing okay. How about you, Drew? Boy, it has been a... I don't know when this is going live or if it's going live, but this has been a crazy last 48 hours for EV news. I uh, know, right? Tesla announced another alcoholic drink. It's very exciting news. <laughs> I had no clue where you were going with that. <laughs> I just pictured announced another alcoholic. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> what? <laughs> what are you talking about? Tell me you didn't buy this one too, please. I, oh, I don't want this. I bought 12 of them. No, I didn't buy any. Uh, you, uh, had just... a, you had a streak going there, though. You got the tequila, and then you got the beer. Yeah. I was like, oh, God. Mike, please. Well, to, you can... This is $500. <laughs> yeah. One, $500 is a little bit too much. Yes. Two, it's the same bottle. All, all it's different with the Tesla Mezcal versus the Tesla tequila is that the Mezcal... Well different liquid inside it but also it's got a like a matte smooth wrap on it but it looks mm. to be the same bottle and they just had some extra and they decided to make a little bit more and put something else in there and they also made some copitas which are like little shot glasses but yeah 500 dollars is a bit much the wife also said no anyways so even if i want to <laughs> and which you asked <laughs> well no yes and no not really it was more of hey look at this thing and she's like you're not getting it i'm like Okay. <laughs> I didn't say anything. I nope. didn't say anything. Why are you pulling your wallet out? I didn't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> Why is there a charge on the card? I didn't. Yeah. 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 So at least with that, that's the, probably the most exciting news, right? There's nothing else that's gone on this week. Everything's else been pretty quiet. That's why no. I assumed you're talking about in terms of an exciting 48 hours. Because as of this recording... And which, by the way, we're doing on a different thing. So if we sound a little bit different or look a little bit different, bear with yeah, us. Yeah, we're mixing things up. We're trying something new. But I guess you, you point in the right direction, not the right direction, but the direction that, of course, I expected you to point being my Rivian shirt, mainly because yeah. Rivian decided to show off what the refresh looks like. And it's a lot bigger than everyone thought. Way bigger, in my opinion. Um, and I can share it with us on the screen now. So I'm gonna. I was able to do this in editing, Drew. Before. <laughs> yeah. Now you don't have to. It's right here. It's a dog, apparently. The new uh, R1T. <laughs> so I guess some differences that uh, are easy to see on it for those that are a little bit unfamiliar with this refresh is that the light bar is a little bit skinnier on the front and back. But well, that's because they're fitting in a charging indicator on the bottom portion of the light bar on the front. On the back, I think, uh, is turning signals and something else. Hazards, I think. Yeah, they yeah they have uh, that little pixel-like uh, gradient. It's like the GMC both. Hummer EV. Yes, except it is on the back and the front. Mm -hmm. um, although the they can be the charging indicator, they can be the hazards uh, there might be some light show stuff and all that but yeah it's cool it's cool so Good there's stuff. five new versions of it and which starts with the <laughs> lfp standard goes to the large and the max and the trimax and then there's a quad max as well which uh feels a little bit overdone in regard or not overdone but they pretty much put all the hardware possible into this thing with the quad max which seems i agree i think it's a much. bit overkill <laughs> We don't know the range of quad max, but I can I just say I really like this new naming structure. It's very simple. Right. Dual standard, dual large, dual, ma dual max, trimax, just, quad max. It's it it's a lot easier to identify what you've got versus yeah. oh, I've got the R1T but with the max pack and the adventure package or whatever. Which right. is still a thing as well, the adventure package, mm -hmm. but now they added the ascend package, which includes some more uh, interior and exterior options, I think. Yeah, I think it includes the uh, stealth badging. Or no, that's Lucid. What is it called? Dark out badging. <laughs> so you can black out all the chrome accents from the factory. That that was the part that surprised me. I did not expect the, there to be so many options. You know, the new stitching is only on the Ascend interior. So you mm -hmm. still have the old stitching on the adventure packages. Um, 
and they introduced these new like wood color options for ascend but they're still keeping the old wood color options i was like oh gee i th i thought this was gonna like simplify the lineup and in a lot of ways i think it kind of makes it more complicated but yeah do you think that this might be a bit much for rivian to support in one factory or do you think this is something that they're maybe capable of doing at this point in their history well, they definitely had a lot of trims and tears before, that's for sure. I just thought the shutdown was going to simplify. It's not that, that the factory can't handle lots of trims. It's just that it makes the... I would imagine it makes the product more challenging to become profitable because you have to have so many different variants of it. But mm -hmm. I don't know. Maybe they've... I, I trust them. I, I feel like they have to know way more about this than I would. And they've probably analyzed everything and they've reaffirmed that they feel confident they can achieve a gross profit on these by the end of the year. So they must think there's a way to do it. I, I do think it probably simplifies things to say you have to get the max pack if you go with the tri-motor or the quad motor. Mm -hmm. um, that that does probably simplify some things. Um I think most people, though, will probably opt for the LFP just because it's the cheapest. It's not a bad choice, especially with the specs that it's got. It still can do like 7,000 pounds of towing. Yeah. Uh, the range isn't awful, and it's because it's an LFP. You can charge it to full, so 258 yeah. to 270 miles of range estimated with that thing. That's not terrible. And the rims, I think, are my the new... Uh, our rims that they've got where it's pretty much a hoop that just clicks on to the side of the wheel or the rim. I yeah. Guess. The aero panel or whatever. Uh, it's like a donut. And I think that's just, it is. it's both simple and the design looks fantastic. So whoever designed that kudos to you guys, it looks amazing. Oh, I'm trying to show it. <laughs> uh, I was surprised though, that that was like a, uh, an option uh, add-on. Mm -hmm. It was a kind of a pricey one. They're called range tires, <laughs> twenty-two inches, and they're two thousand bucks extra. Um, but I was watching a uh, what's it called a walkthrough. Rivian it was really cool that they had like an event basically where they invited a bunch of uh, channels to come together and so they could drop all the footage at the same time. And mm -hmm. they were pointing out how this little yellow mark on the wheel helps you identify the valve stem, but it, that's also where you can pull from it to pop the whole thing off because there's a really nice tire underneath that mm -hmm. arrow cover too. Um, so there was just little design cues. And these were 3D printed tires, by the way, which I thought was interesting. Um, tires so have... being the rubber or being the rim? Yeah. You know, no, the, the rubber normally on tires has those little uh what do you call them stems that stick out from yeah. the, the mold release this these don't have those interesting i'd have to look into like, that a little bit oh, more i know that was a thing in tires yet i didn't either that was news to me <laughs> but yeah i would still probably stick with the free tires but mm -hmm. what do you think of the dynamic things. glass roof that they also this is not on the standard range. It's actually something that you, it's, you can't get on the standard range, but on every other option, oh, right. you can uh, add a dynamic glass roof, which uses, I think they call it electrochromatic as well, which is yeah. using electrons, and which is technology has been around for a, a bit, but you're able to uh, polarize the surface so that it goes from transparent to opaque, which is mm -hmm. neat. And I actually have a coworker who's one of their family members actually gets a little bit sick in cars that have these uh, sunroofs all the way oh, really? across the roof of the vehicle. So yeah, it's a bit of a huh. issue for that person and their family to where they tell them like, Hey, can you put the sunshade up? Because I'm getting a little bit we queasy. So possibly having this electrochromatic option might be <laughs> just to service this one person in your family. Uh, <laughs> I have not heard of that, but I believe it. Do you think it's worth it at fifteen hundred dollars? Mm. Yeah, fifteen hundred's kind of a. I don't know. Maybe maybe real world use would be different. I've seen it on so many prototypes in the past. It's kind of cool to finally see it in an actual production vehicle. I know 
I think it was Lucid had one on their prototypes, but then never shipped it. And maybe in real world use, I might feel differently, but at least for now, I feel like you would probably just pick one and leave it there, in which case the 1500 would feel kind of wasted. Um, but I think for 50, I mean, for much cheaper, you can get third party accessories that just kind of pop in there. I've seen people get, and you can, you know, darken out the whole roof if you don't want it to be glass and that's probably a lot cheaper <laughs> um, right. but it would get annoying if you were switching it back and forth all the time be like wait let me take it out wait let me put it back let me take it out um mm -hmm. so if there is a market for it i'd be curious but my guess is most people would just pick one and leave it there so I'd, i don't think it's worth it but what about you probably not uh i was thinking about it yesterday on the drive home and because I drive a Model Y, I always have that glass roof above me yeah. and it's tinted a little bit. Tesla tints yeah. it that way. It's not just a glass panel above you that is just streaming light around your head all the time. There is some uh, sun shielding to it. So that way you're not getting cooked every single time you get in the car. Uh, with us being in California, it gets pretty hot in these cars anyways, even though... Oh, yeah. Uh, I live in the Bay Area. It can still cook a car decently well. So my car was 150 degrees oh, in, on the inside yesterday. <laughs> that is way too hot. But yep. thinking about it on the way home, I thought, is this something that I would engage at all if I had this electrochromatic roof? And I don't think I would because I already. I, I guess it depends on how tinted the glass pane is in the Rivian. Because if it's pretty much the same tint as the Model Y, I'm not going to deal with it because I already deal with it already with not being able to shade it. And I haven't bought a third party panel to cover it up if I want to make it darker in there or quote unquote cooler. That wouldn't change the temperature, would it? It's just a visibility thing. Uh, visibility. It... So that's something. I'm, a, uh, I'm not well versed in. <laughs> pretty much uh heat and light principles okay. I, in my studies i did do a few courses in heat transference thermodynamics mm -hmm. and all that i'd have to revisit those notes and then look at what uh elect yeah what the technology behind electrochromatic roofs or panels does to it because if it's just a visibility light thing it's not going to change much if it's a thermal light thing or thermal energy, thermal heat. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a, if it's on that wavelength, then it will affect uh, the heat inside the car. But yeah, if it's just if it's just visible light, all you're doing is just darkening it so that way you don't have distractions of I don't know rain, hail, clouds, whatever yeah. else is above you. So okay, not sure, but that is worth looking into. What about the other add-ons? Like, how do you feel about the uh, utility panel slash, you know, air compressor becoming a, a paid feature? I think that's a great idea, even though this is now an option that they have to consider uh, including or not including. And the factory, that's, I think, my biggest worry is that there's uh -huh. so many different options. Yeah. They're really going to have to look at the spec sheet now. They're going to be on the levels of Ford in regards mm. to how Ford has to deal with every single customer's custom order and then yep. look at what is attached to that truck while it's going through, snaking through their factory at the Rouge facility right. with uh, Rivian at their normal facility. This is just another module that they have to think about whether we're installing that in there or if it's just going to be... I, I'm actually curious. I don't know if they have pictures of, it, of what it looks like without the utility panel. I was just, just going to say that. I, I wonder what it looks like without... What did they put there? It could just look like instead? a panel there. Just like... I think about the F-150 Lightning where it's got a charge port on one side but not the other, but it's still very identical in terms oh, yeah. of the panels. So it could maybe. just be that where it looks like an identical panel, but you just can't yep. open it. And if you yep. maybe take a... Uh, that's another thing. I wonder if you can add it on later. If you could go to the service center and add oh, on the utility panel, that'd be neat. That'd be interesting. But I, I did have to use my air compressor just the other day. I hit a nail or whatever. Oof. And <laughs> it was, I was like, these are not the craziest technology. It's cool to have it integrated into the bed, but the one I have was like 15 bucks. And 
mm-hmm. so far it's gotten me out of several <laughs> uh, leaky tire situation. Right. I think the utility of that utility panel is one, the gear guard or uh, the... Oh, the forget, little lock thing. Yeah. the You pretty much just stick it in like USB-A or USB-C right. uh, thumb drive. It is intuitive. Yeah. Which I like about it. And I think that's maybe more of the selling point of it is that you can get this accessory and plug it in there and it locks itself in. It's not like someone can easily cut it because it's a really strong yeah. cable that's plugged into right. a system that you can't easily trick as far as I can tell. Yeah. But the fact that there is empty space in the sidewall of the bed of this truck that can be used to put in an air compressor and a locking system, I think is great. And then having Mm -hmm. that empty space there seems a little bit wasteful to me, but at the same time, I get it if it means that you're saving $650. So yeah, I, I I don't really land on either side on whether if it's too, if it's overpriced or justified, but if people want it, it's an option, which I like. I like that there's an option for that rather than they just took it away and they say, well, here's a third party one that we're putting in with the, uh, the spare tire uh, cubby that we've got in the bed. Sure. Well, it's a different price. I don't think I was, I talked about this in my video. I was a little hyped and excited. <laughs> so I missed some details, but how do you feel about it in the R1S? They don't call it the utility panel. They just call it the air, air compressor, compressor for 350. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's nice in the R1S. I, that's the one thing that I kind of came out of this is that this refresh actually diverged the R1T and R1S a little bit more from what I can tell is that so? they're a yeah. little bit from what uh, Jerry rig and auto buyers guide were saying was that these vehicles have their own, well, maybe not their own, but their parts are a little bit more different. It kind of went the way of the model three and the model Y where they used to be very similar, like 70% shared parts. But yeah. now you can definitely tell that the Model 3 and the Model Y are a bit different exterior-wise and then interior-wise as well. So I think that's kind of what this refresh has done, is it's delineated the R1T and R1S on the inner parts, or like the parts that you can't really see as much. The exterior parts mm. look relatively the same, and they share the same design language in this refresh. But yeah, uh Again, an air compressor in the R1S is nice if uh, in the case that you get a flat and you don't want to carry around this big module or you have to worry about carrying around a big module. It's just already built in. Yeah. I think they mentioned as well that the R1S suspension has changed quite a bit. And and better than it already... It already was really good, but apparently it's even better now. And um, I think that the R1T didn't change as much. So that that point is uh, even more t- true as far as uh, ride quality goes. They're differentiating the two. And uh, from what I've heard, they're still only making R1S right now. They haven't restarted R1T production. Well, maybe they don't have the parts ready yet or they want to focus on the R1S in regards to... It is these- more popular. Yeah, it's more popular. It's also a new refresh and they're having to retool a bunch of different things and reorganize the whole uh, manufacturing line for these new updates. So it makes sense to be a little bit more simpler with, or not be a little bit more simpler, tie down a lot more variables that could cause issues in producing these updated vehicles. So I I don't fault them for that. I think that's a great idea because people are... People are buying these things, but it's not like a Model 3 or Y or a Corolla where they're having to produce a whole bunch to meet demand. There is demand. It's just not a high demand, so they don't have to necessarily worry about it. So they just they looked at which one sells the most, and obviously it's the R1S. So they're like, all right, let's focus on this one, try to iron out all the kinks with it, and then move on the R1T. Uh, I couldn't tell, I don't know if you've looked at it, did they do the thing that I was hoping that they would do in the last podcast, which was uh, taking that giant body panel and bisecting (laughs) it a bit so that way we don't have the issue of almost, not a total, but a very expensive repair on the R1T. 
because this panel that reaches all the way from the top of the roof line over the driver's all the way <laughs> wrapping around to the back bumper of the vehicle. Uh, if anything happens, you have to replace that whole panel, which yeah. is a little bit of an issue. As far as I can tell, I don't think they did. It seems like it's still there. Mm -hmm. um, maybe there's something wire. I mean, I know they reduced a ton of wiring. I, I think they said 1.6 miles worth of wiring was removed. That's nice. Uh, which is a lot. So I don't know if that had played into the complication of the repairability. I didn't hear them talk much about that panel, but I did hear them mention in other interviews that um, the battery pack has been redesigned so that more servicing of the pack can be done without removing it. Mm -hmm. So they can just lift the truck up and work on the BMS or work on different modules and leave the whole pack still attached to the vehicle, which should streamline service. So I think there was some emphasis to better serviceability, but probably not as much as we'd like. What's funny is, you know, the new like animated uh, renderings mm -hmm. that That's we saw. Using like, the Unreal Engine for yeah. their whole UI interface on the inside of the vehicle. I'm trying to find it. Here it is. Um, I have a recording of it here. And uh, what's funny is it kind of looks like, not quite, but it kind of looks like they fixed that problem in the animation, which prematurely got me excited because <laughs> I was just like, oh, man, it looks like there's more like, uh, here, I'll share it here. Um, it looks like there's more lines on this design. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but no, it's just a styling thing. Right. But, I do like the style. It definitely... It, you like it? I like the fun of it. And that's what I appreciate about Rivian is they're all about adventure and fun. And they're not yeah. trying to make it ultra realistic. And uh, yeah, I'm, I see that every day in the Y. I don't see the new one like you see in the 3 with the uh, updated mm -hmm. UI. But it, yeah, I know what my vehicle looks like. <laughs> I don't need to be reminded of it on the inside. Yeah, I could change the color of it, but like, I don't need to look at it there. But the fact that it's all beautifully styled, almost like the Borderlands cell shading that is popularized in that video game yeah. series. It, yeah, it is. It's very unique, and that's what I enjoy about it, is that they're having fun with not just the styling of the vehicle, but the styling of the area around it for whatever drive mode that you're in, whether it's all-purpose, conservative or conserve uh sport right. or snow and then i'm sure there's even more with more of the well i guess that's on road so there's also off road so there's yeah. a bunch more as well and it looks like the ui people are having just a ball uh <laughs> changing it up and i do look forward to seeing yeah. if they change this throughout the seasons if they oh, offer something cool. that's a little bit different or like the christmas yeah. update or holiday updates and all that uh, or even what modes they might add later or what features that they might add later that integrates this cell shading stylized look at your vehicle and whatever environment it's in. What I think smart about this whole thing is it, it doubles down on, we're not trying to make the R1 necessarily like more affordable. Mm -hmm. We're just trying to justify that high price. <laughs> and some people may not like that. I mean, technically, with this whole quad max, they're taking $3,000 deposits for, they're not saying what it'll cost. <laughs> I think and... someone said, or was it auto buyer's guide quoted saying like 105,000, I think. That'd be pretty reasonable actually. Cause the tri motor is a hundred. So <laughs> if they up it to quad for just an extra five, yeah, I don't, I don't know exactly what it'll be, but it'll, sure. it'll be up there. And technically that means most expensive Rivian, of all time, but it is also the most capable Rivian of all time. So it, as they're trying to pave way for the R2 line and the R3 line, which will be the more affordable models, it's probably wise to figure out, okay, let's not just make these existing vehicles. Um, let's not just take out a bunch of stuff. Let's figure out how to incentivize uh, the market that is people who are willing to drop that kind of money on an SUV or a truck, make sure they get the best of the best, the camera upgrades sound really good the nvidia processor this they got and they're sh they're, they're not calling it driver plus anymore which mm -hmm. is weird 
They just they're calling it Rivian's new autonomy platform. But uh, it what didn't seem mean? ready. I, I watched a few YouTubers trying it out and it was not doing very good. So I, <laughs> I don't think they're ready to talk about that yet, but they are probably making some new driver assistance features on this NVIDIA chip, which is bad news for existing R1 owners, good news for future R1 owners. Sure. I was specking my own version of it out during this. Yeah. And I pretty much at the end of it. And I realized that one of the interior options that they've included is new mats. And it's not just oh, the yeah. carpet mats, it's, but they also right. have chili witch mats, which uses <laughs> reeds and which looking it up, chili witch is durable and easy to clean, or that's what it's quoted to be, which I like. And it's different and unique. It's not as a, uh, it's not just here's a giant rubber mat to put in the foot well where you put your feet while you're sitting there or driving or anything like that. It's it something a little bit more stylized looking. And yeah, they look just, nice. It looks great. I, I enjoy it. There's, it seems like there's two different colors that they've got there, unless it's just lighting changes. But the, uh, yeah, I think, I think they're different. Green mat versus reed mat. <laughs> yeah, one's white, one's green. <laughs> I do wonder if that changes based off of what interior option that you got, whether it's black, mm. white, or green. Yeah. I guess that's something that I didn't see when I was configuring a version of it is that I don't see green for the, uh, I guess for spoilers, I'm configuring a dual max R1T with the adventure package. And it just has black mountain, black mountain with dark ash wood and ocean coast with dark ash wood. Mm. So, and you yeah i don't see green anymore so i'm curious if that's something that's only for the tri-motor and the quad motor yeah. you to... gotta buy a whole different trim to get these mats <laughs> it's slowly becoming kind of that legacy auto mentality with, a lot of these, <laughs> uh, with the startups is that they're getting a little bit more and more options that they're now having to say okay we can't just give everyone every single option with this trim we have to delineate them a little bit more so that way these people can get it, but these people can't unless they upgrade to this amount. And then we'll give that option to them. But then once you get up to a maxed out option, this is just what you're getting. <laughs> yeah. I uh, I don't think they should lead with that. Okay, what do I get if I buy the Trimax? Well, you get these new floor mats. <laughs> They're really great. But yeah, it's... Do you think Tesla's going to respond... Do you think they're going to try to make the Cyber Beast faster than the Quad Max? Well, I'd like to see actually is the Cyber Beast and the regular, uh, was it dual motor, uh, get a price update? Because oh, well, yeah. I think it's yeah, about time for the, was it the, the launch edition to go away? Foundation series. Oh, yeah, foundation, yeah. whatever it is. Uh, I think it's about time for that to go away in that we get this more competitive price. So then you are actually cross-shopping an R1T and a Cybertruck, and it makes sense to cross-shop them a little bit more rather than, well, if you want an electric truck and you want one for super cheap, I guess you could find like an F-150 Lightning. But if you want something that's, that's probably more capable bet. and stylized and bespoke, go for the R1T. And then if you're, you got money oozing out of your pockets, I guess maybe get the weird polygon on wheels. <laughs> yeah i think everybody's caught on to it and the the hype has probably died down by now it's been it's been a while yeah the delivery started november hmm. it's june now jeez yeah i Time i did flies. not yeah i did not think foundation series would last this long um well, I guess maybe I did. It all just depended on if if they find someone willing to pay for it, then they'll do it. But uh, yeah, it would be very refreshing for them to finally start delivering non-foundation series. Um, mm. But I I doubt that they're going to drop directly to that next price bracket that's on the website to like 80000 I wouldn't be surprised if they say, okay, now we'll start delivering if you spec it with maybe it's not foundation series, but now it's the white interior with the big wheels and 
maybe if you buy FSD for 8,000, that moves it faster. So it turns into a $90,000 truck instead of a $100,000 truck. And then they see what the demand is for that. And then if they run out of demand there, then they start saying, okay, we'll start delivering ones with the ugly, more efficient tires, <laughs> but still FSD. So now it's a $85,000 truck. It's, you know, I think that's how Tesla usually works down the pricing ladder. It's just like a little, little bit at a time, not all at once. Um, but yeah, the the used market for foundation series is quite telling because uh, everybody's already quickly figuring out like, uh, I'm not going to drop a hundred grand if this thing's going to become, you know, 60 grand in a, in a year. <laughs> mm. Not a not a great investment. And everybody who is more bright, price conscious knows, yeah, I'm just going to wait. I'll just wait. But Sure. I still think Rivian pretty much only made the quad max because of the cyber beast. Possibly so. Or they just really wanted to show what a maxed out R1T or R1S can achieve. Whether they're actually directing that spotlight at Tesla, only they would tell you or they would know and they probably <laughs> won't tell you. It's but... just a little convenient. You know, the tri-motor uh, that they came out with is more horsepower and faster than the outgoing quad motor that they used to have. Mm -hmm. So you could have just said, you know, with our new in-house design drive unit, we can do more with three motors than we used to do with four. And that now it's, you know, more efficient, simplified the production a little bit. And it's amazing and provides all these new drive mode t uh, tech and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, so they, they could have just stopped there, I think, but said, no, no, let's keep going. Let's. We want to be able to say fastest or quickest, I should say, quickest electric truck on the market. And they could only do that if they undercut the beast, which they did. So, yeah. Yeah. So I, I finished specking mine. It's a dual max R1T adventure. All right. We're looking at Mike's and, spec uh, here. <laughs> I like the LA silver. I'm glad that's the free color. That's what I thought as well. I was looking at all the other colors and I thought, you know what? LA Silver's not bad. So no. I figured LA Silver with the max battery pack because my wife loves range. So it'd be yeah. 420 miles. So towing, if we were to tow nice. 210 miles, I think. Yeah. So that's not terrible. Uh, and that's max, of course. So like it's realistically like 180 miles or whatever, which isn't yeah. terrible. Uh, with uh, the dark out package as well to delineate the bottom of the vehicle to the top of the vehicle where typically the i think the bottom back bumper is a little bit more chromed out yeah uh, so i've blacked that out and the trim as well to tie it nice. all together a little bit more Very and clean. then i include the utility panel for some reason just i guess why not uh <laughs> and then i added on the dark ashwood interior <laughs> along with yeah. the chilla witch mats Oh, and good, good. Kept the glass roof as was as is, but added the camp speaker because I think that thing is definitely. Oh, you it. like the speaker? I oh, love interesting. The speaker. It's great. Okay, it's both a light and a speaker, and you can put it outside the vehicle. Don't need to carry a speaker with me if I'm camping. There uh, you go. It's already there, and then I added some crossbars so that adds it up to an estimated price of around eighty nine thousand dollars, in which I think is a bit less than what I was specking it to in the past. Oh, really? But that was with, I believe, either the Rivian Blue or the Red Canyon exterior. Oh, color. you probably wanted Compass Yellow if it was an option, huh? Yeah, <laughs> I'll never forgive Rivian for that. But <laughs> you could say, I wouldn't order one right now if oh, it was Compass Yellow. So that's something that I was talking with my <laughs> wife. She's like, maybe our future vehicle is a Rivian with all these cool updates. But we're not mm. like looking to get one now and our truck no, is it's fine as it is, time. but the red is pretty cool and the blue is pretty cool. But the silver, I think, is not a terrible uh, standard paint color. No. no, that was a great choice by them. Mm -hmm. oh, Are you, the dark out package <laughs> on the R1S looks so much better. Than it looks the very package. mean. I think it's this package. this line. That was what my my other Mike friend did. He blacked out that line. I don't. I wish they would have changed that. I'm not a fan of that. The trim that, piece that goes from the yeah 
front uh, glass all the way pretty much to the back glass. So all the way to the back. It looks so much better with the dark out package, in my mm -hmm. opinion. It unifies it a little um, bit more and delineates yeah. the black from the white without being too contrasty, I guess. It's a little yeah. bit more subtle in a great way. So this is, if I were to spec one, this is pretty much my dream spec. I love the Red Canyon. <laughs> um, I like, I wish I could get those new interior. I like the new wood options, but they're only on like the, what's it called? Ascend mm -hmm. uh, trims, which makes you have to get all the performance stuff. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm not as into that. I would be fine with the dual motor. I like LFP. Um, so 258 that's fine by me this this is still all-wheel drive which is plenty so if i if i were in the market this would be pretty sweet and that's uh 80 grand dang it it's <laughs> it's 650 bucks above the tax credit oh but it's lfp it wouldn't get the tax credit anyway i guess it doesn't matter um it's not a bad spec so that, though. it looks pretty beautiful no it, I just think it's cool that there's an LFP three row SUV on the market that also has, you know, really good software. Mm -hmm. I wish it got the dials though. That would have been cool. I think it's fine with what it has in terms of the user interface on the wheels. And then it's still they, pretty clean. They pretty much did just a software upgrade on also the was it blind spot cameras. Uh yes. that here when you turn on the turn signals, I think is a really great touch. That's something that I'll support what Doug DeMiro has said in a video that he made a while back. That should be a standard feature in most vehicles because we're requiring at least a center screen on most vehicles. So that way you have a backup camera because yep. I believe that's yep, backup really cameras mandated. required. Yep. Uh, I think the blind spot cameras that turn on whenever you put on a turn signal should be also a standard because that way you are ensuring that people are not missing it. And even if they are too careless to look over their shoulder to see if anyone's in the adjacent lane that they're moving into, it is in front of them when they turn on the signal. And this is, of course, <laughs> if someone is negligent enough to not look over their shoulder, they're probably not turning on the turn signal. But yeah. at least that's another way to show what is uh, flanking you without yes. having to do a physical action of turning your neck or turning your head and cranking your neck. It's faster. Bit. Mm -hmm. I think it's a safety thing. Absolutely. Like, uh, I've gotten so used to it now. Um, that anytime I drive my old car, I still look at the radio every time I signal it. And I'm like, Oh wait, I got to do it around this way, but I've gotten so used to it on the model three. Mm -hmm. Um, and especially for older people, I think that's one of the main reasons as you get older, uh, you tend to be more, uh, not intentionally, but just more of a dangerous driver because as you get older, you can't move your neck as quickly. Um, mm -hmm. So if I was older or, you know, more elderly or anybody, if you could just signal and just look down at the screen to see that it's safe to move instead of having to do this, you know, when you're young, you can do it pretty quick. But as you get older, it's like it's like a whole thing. <laughs> and it really takes more time with your eyes off the road, off what's going on in front of you. So. I agree. I'm I'm really glad they added that, and I was really glad that they said the new cameras are 60 FPS. I believe they said via yeah, over-the-air update, the old R1s will still get that blind spot feature, mm -hmm. but the cameras aren't as good. They won't be as sharp, and the frame rate isn't as high. So, uh, mm -hmm. and also in in video, I saw that they kind of they have a little animation to them. The camera feed doesn't just pop up; it kind of like slides up onto this it slides up yeah and i was like oh rivian software is getting very good i'm i'm very happy about that nice i also specced up a uh, r1s which is probably this would be the dream vehicle that i i don't have money for, i don't have money for either <laughs> but if i were to get an r1s it'd probably be with, be with the new storm blue option that they have now oh yeah which is a little bit more of a hazy uh, blue than what they've got on the Rivian blue. There's your but... first one. What happened to the old one? <laughs> <laughs> but pretty much Sorry, the, the tri-motor all-wheel drive with the max battery pack, but with storm blue bl blackout package Ooh. and all that. Yeah, it's kind of a grayish mm -hmm. blue. It looks really good. And the plaid mats are neat, but I'd probably cover them anyways with the... Uh, uh, 
the all weather floor mats because I'd want to <laughs> keep those a little bit nicer for uh, nicer drives. But yeah, so it, 115. Your dream arm went ass. Yeah. 115. <laughs> 115. 000. It's wow. stupid money. But it gets like, I, I, even, I even see what the uh, range is estimated on this thing 380 or 405 on conserve. That's which great. Isn't terrible. But I guess that's the other thing. I, I want to, I'd like to see if they fix the issues with the conserve mode. Because what I've heard is that when you put in that conserve mode, it, uh, pretty much destroys your tires a little bit more because it's riding oh. a little bit lower and it's doing, I forget what it's doing, but what I was talking with the coworker is that it apparently, uh, wears out your tires a little bit quicker and already EVs wear out their tires pretty quick. Yeah. So to wear I out think your it tires, decouples the rear motors okay. and just makes the front wheels do all the work. And I think that results in uneven wear, but mm -hmm. Yeah, if it's a nice afford, update, though. Yeah, if you can afford that kind of vehicle, maybe you don't mind the tire maintenance. But mm. <laughs> yeah, it's still annoying. That's something that you know I've seen in other vehicles too that would really bother me is when they do the staggered tire layouts. Mm -hmm. It's like now you can't just rotate them. It's like ah, now you gotta service these versus these, and I would get old for me. I I I don't know if I could get used to that. <laughs> We'll have to ask Randy how that's going with his Model Y performance. Oh, are those staggered? I believe so, yeah. His uh, uh, rear wheels are a different tire than his front. Interesting. Yeah, I wouldn't like that. <laughs> that would take some getting used to for sure. But yeah. Um, do you have any more Rivian thoughts before I throw another? I think it's totally valid that they haven't added Nax to this thing. I think they already added way really? too many things. Okay. Uh, adding Nax is probably not something that they need to add with these, and they already have an adapter that you can get. So if you need to plug in at superchargers, that option's there rather than having to. Well, I guess the same would be said if they adopted Nax, then they could just get a Nax to CCS adapter. But I don't know. Not having I Nax <laughs> and not being a 800 volt architecture, I don't think is necessary for this update yet. I think once the R2 and R3 are coming out, that's when it seems like an 800 volt architecture makes sense for the R1 lineup. But for Maybe. the only two customer orderable vehicles that you could buy from Rivian today, I think it's perfectly fine being a 400 volt architecture with a CCS uh, port. We'll see. I think the demand will tell because if it if it results in an Osborne, I think they could very likely wish they would have moved on next sooner. Because I, I I can tell you, if I was in the market for a Rivian, that would I would be motivated to wait. I if I'm going to buy a vehicle that expensive. I'm going to use it for a decade plus. I don't want to have to fuss around with an adapter every single time. You know, I charge that thing. So well, that's I, if you're always going to a supercharger. I would. <laughs> right. I, I don't want to go to ea and adventure networks are great but there's not a lot of them yet so i would i would be going to superchargers and then it sounds like if rivian's moving to nax a lot of adventure networks down the road are going to be nax too mm -hmm. so i i think the ccs vehicles need to be phased out as quickly as possible but you're right it would probably complicate the manufacturing there's already a ton of changes but uh time will tell whether or not that was a a good idea to wait on yeah this was a nice surprise though to wrap it all up yeah in terms yeah. of a, a nice rivian bow is how that... do you feel about the new light bar though i think it's great. like the new one yeah I, you might be a little bit more it seems like you're a little bit more skeptical of it or not as a fan of the new look but i like if the... it's cheaper i'm a fan <laughs> Well, that's the thing that you've now got instead of just a running light, you now have a running light along with a charging indicator on the front and then additional LEDs on the back for hazards or turn signals and all that. So it, it might be a little bit more costly, but hopefully the whole manufacturing process and whatever parts that they revise to make it uh, less costly in terms of uh, components that they have to put into this thing. Hopefully it's a net even at the end of the day yeah. for these products or at I least so. at least in that even and uh hopefully more in reality a uh, or maybe not more in reality but more ideally 
a yeah. gain in profits per production yeah. of vehicle. For sure. I hope so. Yeah, maybe I need to see it in person, but there's just something about the old light bar that I thought was very clean. It was just a very simple, just flat texture all the way around. And I still see it on the R2 and R3 prototypes. Maybe we need some render artists to put the new light bar design on those, or maybe they're meant to be different. I don't know. But uh, I would think at least with the R1 lineup, it deserves them with this yeah. uh, charging indicator and all that with the R2 and R3. I think they can get away with the old Rivian styling because they're meant to be a little bit more consumer friendly. And also, yeah, it, it doesn't need to get complicated. <laughs> they can be. Well, that's just what I'm curious about. Like, I, I haven't seen them talk about it. I'd be curious if this new design is more expensive or cheaper or the same, in which case, is it a feature you want as an R1 premium or is this just the new way of doing things? I don't know. It'd be curious. I'd be curious. We definitely need a because... cost analysis on this thing. Yes, Monroe, <laughs> pony up. Let's <laughs> let's tear it apart. <laughs> let's look inside. That would be fun. But... Right. Uh, Anywho. One, one thing I want to add, a little shout out to, since we're in the adventurous spirits, mm -hmm. uh, Lightship, I don't know if you've heard of them. They're a oh, yeah. ERV company in which yeah, yeah. I was thinking we should do an ERV episode at some point covering all the different... RVs that have some There's electrical addition to them. Yeah. Uh, but with Lightship, they announced recently on this, like this week, that uh, they're adopting NAX on their uh, <laughs> L1 trailer, which is, I think, the only one that they've shown off so far. They haven't shown off anything mm -hmm. smaller yet. I don't recall. But I don't think they have, no. It's going to natively have NAX, which I think is a smart idea because that's the most ubiquitous port here in America and this thing's going to be produced in America. So I think you kind of have to now. <laughs> yeah. If you need a quick charge up, I would think Nax would be the way to go. My only concern with this and which is already a concern at the beginning is how to charge this thing or how to back it up into <laughs> a, a spot, whether you are just backing up like a car and the port is on the back yep. and you can easily plug it in. Or if you need something a little bit more trailer friendly, uh, so that way you can charge up the trailer. <laughs> or here's something even more complicated: if you have to back this up into a uh, stall, and then that would be in, my guess. It'd and then you the need back. to decouple it, and then charge up your whatever EV that you've got that can also supercharge at uh, Tesla superchargers. So then this you, brings up the exact yeah, issue I have with the light ship. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's like, isn't it kind of weird that a trailer is announcing a port design? <laughs> I thought it was a trailer. It'd be like saying, what kind of fuel does your trailer take? <laughs> In a way, a little weird. there's a lot of stuff that actually goes into trailers. If uh, mm -hmm. you looked into it, there's water, there's uh, propane mm -hmm. in some cases, batteries. Well, that makes sense. So with like electricity, which is another thing that you think about when you're trailing around, being able to top it off a lot quicker because it's got a battery pack in it uh, with a smaller port maybe isn't a bad idea. But yeah, it seems that's why I wanted to bring up is it seems kind of funny that a trailer company or a company that is going to be making a electrified trailer is announcing yeah. the next port for their product. But at the same time, like, if you were going to charge it up, the most ubiquitous port in America right now, I believe, is the Nax port. So it makes oh, sense yeah. to support that. That's but even so, headed. if you think that's weird, a motorcycle company being Verge announced like a while ago, I think a year or so ago, that they were going to have the Nax port in, which a motorcycle makes a little bit more sense because you're driving that thing around and you're going to need to top it off a bit and having something that is a small port makes sense on a uh, smaller transportation device <laughs> vehicle. Yeah. But with the giant trailer, well, I feel like you could get away with either port and not have too much of an issue. Yeah. There's a lot of great ideas with the light ship that I like, you know, the, the smaller frontal area and they put a pretty sizable battery pack in it and they give it its own powertrain to reduce the range loss. It's fairly aerodynamic. It looks really nice on the inside. It's just, my my two biggest issues with it are that it's like 
it has a battery pack inside almost the size of an EV. And mm -hmm. they're targeting like 120 grand for that thing. House on and, wheels, Drew. <laughs> <laughs> I I'm okay with that idea. I'm just like, if you're gonna go that high price, just add a steering wheel and some pedals. I I think 120 grand for something that you have to still buy an EV truck for. Turning this into a uh, easily, I mean, what are people dropping on their truck? Fifty thousand at least. Usually, way more than that um, for an electric truck. This is a $200,000 experience and mm -hmm. it requires an electrified truck to tow it around. And then, like you said, you're either going to have to back the trailer in, depending on the parking lot, you're going to be way too long trailer plus truck. So you have to uncouple, let it charge and then couple back up, move it. Or they did show, I saw a demo where you can hook up an iPad to the light ship and steer it. You can move it around like a giant RC car, which is cool. So maybe that'll help. But then you move the, then you got to move your truck in to charge your truck, or I guess maybe decouple and charge both at two different stalls. So you're occupying two spaces. But I was like, this seems like more complex than just making an electrified RV that you can drive. So that's the thing, even already, if you're getting into like van life type stuff, it goes it starts around a hundred to two hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I get it, but also, do you want to buy something that can drive itself, or do you want to tow it around? Because a lot of vehicles, well, it, it depends whether you want a smaller space or a bigger space. And with the light ship, it's offering a very big environment that's very luxurious feeling inside and out. Yeah. Where with a that. van, if you're going to make that. You're either making a giant limo, which is probably not the way to go. Uh, I wouldn't do a van. I'm saying full size RV, same size as the light ship, if not bigger. Just make it as arrow as you can. Mm -hmm. Make it two hundred thousand dollars, and now you occupy one space, and you don't have to decouple as much. Yeah, I think the issue with that is that if it's on its own, you're having to. You're, you're pretty much you're running into the same problem that EVs are running into today is that if you want more range, you're going to have to throw in more batteries. And mm -hmm. I don't think that's what their argument is. I think their argument is we want to electrify the trailer experience and you already have a truck, most likely just tack on uh, a tow hitch onto it. And there we go. You're ready to go versus having to buy a whole another vehicle that you have to, I mean, you have to insure both of these or you should insure both of these. <laughs> it's a very but, expensive accessory. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's trailering in general. Uh, yeah. But with something like this, I think their focus is more, it's less on being able to drive itself, even though it's driving itself is for just adjusting it in a spot, whether you're uh, boondocking out in the middle of the wilderness or you're at, I don't know, some... <laughs> <laughs> some camping world or not camping world but uh something else like that some camping area that has trailer hookups or maybe doesn't have trailer hookups uh mm -hmm. i feel like electric rvs and we can get into this more later do have a market for those that want to unlock a little bit more in regards to towing with an ev truck or even just not even towing with an ev truck towing with a truck in general it's able to assist the range deficit rather than it just being a mass that you're having to pull and you're seeing that decrease in range it's able to sustain it which i think is more of the focus is that you're sustaining range rather than having to see that range decrease or add in a whole lot more batteries just to match what a typical drive might be i just think that while you are sustaining more range, thanks to the battery pack and drivetrain, you're drastically increasing and complicating the charge time. So mm -hmm. that's that's the cost. It's like, okay, now your range doesn't take a hit, but now when you do need to recharge, you've got two batteries, two ports, and they got to be decoupled and moved around and stuff. And sure. I, I think that compromise, they've probably done the market analysis, I'm guessing. They probably realize the trailer market is much bigger than the RV market. So, mm -hmm. you know, you, you don't have to buy an electric truck. So you could you could tow this with a, a diesel or gas or whatever and still, 
you know, it's applicable to a wider demographic, but I question that when you're targeting 120, 100. Forty thousand dollars, anyway, sure. <laughs> and I'm like, I think that demographic is going to be dropping big money anyway. But I guess the yeah. the truck you can disconnect and and then use it as a truck the rest of the year, and then the light ship can just sit around and wait. But yeah, I was just looking at the specs, and it uses depending on the configuration, you buy forty to eighty kilowatt hours, <laughs> which is not a small amount of batteries. No. But I guess the beauty of it is you don't have to charge it up to full capacity for a trip. You don't even have to charge it up to half. You can leave it at a lower state of charge. Hopefully there's some battery management system there that either you can help control and have a yeah. hand in or it has its own smart way of balancing it. Mm -hmm. But you could just use it as a regular trailer, tow it as a regular trailer to where you're not getting that benefit. And you'll still get places, whether you have a electric truck or a gas or internal combustion engine truck. Right. Uh, you'll still have the benefits that it provides and you don't have to worry about plugging in a second trailer, especially mm -hmm. if it's like at an adventure network or Iona or anything else that allows for a little bit more trailer access uh, where mm -hmm. superchargers don't really, it's usually a pull in, not a pull through. So True. being able to be flexible in that manner and still reap the benefits of it, I think is what this L1 trailer from Lightship RV is going to be touting and be able to show its muscle a little bit more at. So even though it's packing a 40 to, or is it 40, 40 to 80 kilowatt hour but, battery yeah, in there? Depending on the trip, the cheap one is 40 kilowatt hours. The more expensive one's 80. Yeah. The focus is more on its solar generation capacity up to three kilowatts and able to sustain uh, appliances running over seven days, probably at a full charge, of course. Uh, but even so at, uh, little to no appliances running and like you're boondocking out in the middle of nowhere and the solar is running, you will get that state of charge back while you're still yeah. sitting there. So you don't even have to worry about the battery as much because it's already got built in a uh, solar. So it's, yeah, it's solar it's makes a ton of sense, but it is trailers. expensive. It's a giant bougie brick that you tow behind your probably bougie truck or SUV. <laughs> it's a very bougie experience. But I think what should get more attention um, that's a lot more of a addressable market is the uh, Polydrop. Have you heard of them? I have heard of Polydrop. And that was, I think, when you were here hanging out in the Bay, I was trying to figure out the name of the Polydrop and I just couldn't figure it out in my head. But what I like about it is that it's not just focused on SUVs. You can yeah. also tow it with a Model 3 if you get the smaller one, I believe. Wow. The, the P19. 640 pounds. <laughs> that's pretty light. I think that's, that's almost crazy. that's almost in your wheelhouse, Drew, in regards to something that is a lot more efficiency focused because it does have that arrow look. It looks somewhat cybery. Yeah. In terms of cross, yeah, it does. Uh, I really, I want to talk more about them in the future. I think they're underrated, and uh, they're working with Aptera. <laughs> I'll need to know more, but I guess let's shelve that for another conversation, maybe in the future. I want to discuss our time at Polestar when you came to the Bay. Oh well. yeah, sure. And our experience looking at the Polestar two and three. And sure. our overall thoughts. I mean, you made a video on it, which documented everything that I was holding the camera for and that you were testing out. But to elaborate for those that just listened to the podcast, uh, you, you came to the Bay Area to hang out and do some other stuff. And uh, I forgot every single time that we've gone to see Lucid that Polestar is a few businesses down in the mall. Yeah, and we just close. we somehow neglected this whole time. But the fact that I saw a Polestar three in there, I alerted you of the existence of the Polestar three there. We decided when you were here, let's go see it. Yeah, I I was whelmed to be honest. Okay. <laughs> I didn't find it uh, too. I, I just think there's way too much overlap and not enough uniqueness about it. I have a hard time figuring out like okay what is unique to this why should you get this over it, there's just so many options on the market now you need more differentiating features 
especially mm-hmm. now with Rivian coming in with the new R1S. I, I would I would so much rather have an R1S than a Polestar 3 at this point based on the software, the storage, uh, the LFP. <laughs> I'm a big fan of that chemistry. And uh, it sounds like the suspension and stuff is really great. Uh, Polestar 3 probably does have very good air suspension too. But yeah, that hood design i it kills me that there's like so many steps to opening the frunks you know mm-hmm. that you have to pop it and then you have to find the latch it's like when we're using the frunk in our car at least it's like it, we're usually like carrying something out and it's like oh quick pop it so we like balance the phone with one hand p- pop the frunk and then lift it up i don't want to have to like go into the car pull the hood button and then find the latch and then unlatch it that's just gonna i'm never gonna use it at that point it just didn't feel as intuitive and the polestar 3 felt very large but still only a five seater couldn't hold more so i nothing about it screamed at me like "Ooh, they've got something special here (laughs) but i don't know what about it did you? almost seem like another blazer effect with mm-hmm. it it's, it's just another crossover suv but it's not even it, it seems big i think it is bigger in terms of size or i guess length i'll double check i'm not to, oh, i'd man. have to look at the specs or it the felt pretty long to me it felt long but the height was definitely less it, it was more in the range of a model y's height uh, it's 192 like, inches according to ai so you can't trust that (laughs) yeah i guess that would be i think five more inches or six more inches than the model y so it Mm -hmm. it is noticeably longer Uh, it's almost half a foot longer but uh it felt very enclosed on the inside that's the first thing that i noticed when we got in was it it didn't feel roomy even though it's an suv it felt almost maybe not as Maybe not restrictive is the right word, but it felt a little bit more cozy, uh, if not equivalent to the Polestar 2's coziness. And that's a uh, sedan almost built on a crossover chassis. Yeah. I liked the 2, actually, quite a bit. There Mm -hmm. was, (laughs) for the price, they've been out for a while, so you can find them at much more reasonable pricing, and they seem fairly efficient. And, you know, I like sedans. I wish more sedans had hatchbacks, but and that one does. So obviously there were other things about the interior just felt a little dated and not well optimized in terms of space. But the two looked good. I love how intuitive the door handles are. They looked simple, easy to understand. Um, I think the EV industry loves to rethink door handles. And I'm a fan of it when it's because i'm a futurist and i'm like ooh, it's different but after having to explain to dozens of people how to open my car door it was kind of refreshing going up to the polestar 2 and being like oh you just grab it (laughs) that's it (laughs) right it's a typical uh a bar that you kind of just grab it's not like you're having to uh flush or it's not like the uh what am i trying to say it's not like the door handles flush with the panel it does yes. emboss a little bit out, but it's not that embossed out to where it's gangly looking. It still yeah. has a stylistic approach to it, and it's very simple and intuitive to use, where with something like the Polestar 3, uh, those door handles were just a mess to deal with. because Yeah, they weren't working those. very well in that prototype either. <laughs> yeah, but you're showing off the Polestar 2 for those that are watching the video. Here's the 3. <laughs> well, here's the 3. And the door you handles. Can see the problem. <laughs> yeah, you can see. I try to go to open it. I, I push it in. Doesn't do anything. So then I. Oh no! I think that's you filming it. But pretty much, uh, there's a lot of weird things with this one. It seemed like it was a prototype. But it trying to just was. open the door, uh, you pull it out because it's flush with the vehicle. But there's a little bit of a hand insert there. Uh, you try to pull it out, but you have to take it an extra notch even more. So it's not like a soft open. It's more of a hard open. Something has to engage when you're uh, displacing that handle out from the vehicle's body. Yeah. And it didn't feel as fluid as I was hoping. The confusing part, I think, for people is going to be, you know, if you own it for a while, you'll know. But 
a lot of people are going to see the door handles flush and not realize that means it's locked. Sure. So Where... you'll have, that happens to my car still all the time because there's no way to tell, uh, you know, if it's locked until you actually push on it and pull, you know, and with the Polestar 2, it has a traditional door handle design. So when you pull on it, you'll know if the door doesn't open that it must be locked. Whereas this, people are going to push on it be like, is it locked or am I doing it wrong? Do I need to reach mm -hmm. under? Do trying to, to jam push? their hand underneath and trying to see if it does yeah. open. If it does, will it even engage? That, that's something of a mystery to us still. It's a. am not saying it's an exclusive to Polestar problem. I'm saying this is an EV-wide industry problem. They're always trying to refine the arrow. Um, so there's, there's learning curves involved and in general, just the, the pull star two in that regard was a little refreshing. I was just like, Oh, bonk. it was All a done. lot simpler. And then especially what you, uh, highlighted before us just trying to get into the front of this pull star three that, uh, I didn't <laughs> no. realize it had, it's kind of a danger in my opinion, it, it, at least yeah, it was smashing a little your fingers because it's got a front splitter on it so that right. way air can go yeah, over the hood and even just trying to open it was just a mess to try to get in and then it felt like yeah. i was pinching my fingers just trying to open it up and then once it's finally open you're like great but then you have to close it and <laughs> i don't think you're supposed to just slam it down you're supposed to let it come down to a rest and then push down and even yeah. when you do, you're you're almost smashing your fingers when you're trying to ease it down first and then trying to push it down. So that front splitter caused a little bit too much uh, obstruction in the process of trying to close or open the front, which I didn't like. Yeah. The design looks interesting on the front. It almost reminds me of a gravity on like the front or three quarters view. But mm -hmm. yeah, that arrow feature, I, I feel like some optimization... Uh, or at least some usability studies were skirted in the process yeah. of making it. I agree. Definitely. Um, what would help a lot if you're going to have that kind of front spoiler-esque design where you have the air going underneath this, this design. If if at that price point, I would just say it should be a powered trunk to just yeah. open and close. It does own. start at around like 73,000. Yeah, it's up there. It's that again, that's the confusing thing. I think you put it pretty well either in your video or when we we're talking in person afterward. Mm -hmm. Is it feels like they're targeting in between uh sizes and styles for these vehicles. Yeah. It doesn't this is like the price of a like a luxury SUV and it's touting some features of a luxury SUV, but it the size doesn't match up with an SUV. And it doesn't have a lot of luxurious features, in my opinion, that would claim like that would help it be that. And I mean, it's got massaging seats. Ours didn't, but it will. <laughs> I guess so. It would be nice uh, to pick this out in the future and try to drive it around. Yeah, I, th I would guess the ride quality is very, very good. Um, mm -hmm. But it's only about seven inches shorter than an R1S. R1S is. 200 in inches and Polestar 3 is 193 inches. So it's it's very close in size to a three-row SUV without being one. Um, so yeah, I, I agree. I think that they need to find a way to extend, spread out the lineup to cover up a few more, uh, a few more things. Mm -hmm. Well, what's interesting is when we walked in, I noticed that in some photos of the Polestar 3, it's got uh, what looks to be a LiDAR sensor suite on oh, the yeah. roof of it. But when we went and saw it in person, it didn't have it. So I thought, okay, maybe I was thinking yeah, about the Polestar so 4. And the Polestar 4, I don't know if it has that standard or not. But I don't some know of these. They know. <laughs> I, I, so that's something I'm curious about is what packages you can get with this thing. And I guess you could do the online configurator and uh, there's available cars already for the launch edition that you can choose on their website. That's for the three or the, the three. Oh, slightly hilarious. So that's the other thing is that this thing's coming out in the next month. 
if not already out right now. Wow. Oh, there we go. Early August for a lot of these things is what it says. I'd be curious how many orders they have for it, like what the demand is. Sure. I, I don't know. A lot of these launch editions start at, about it. <laughs> yeah. These launch editions start at eighty one thousand. Which Ooh. that's also for yeah, quick delivery. Oh, that's a lot. 300, but even still. It's a bit for something that is just a tad bit bigger than a Model Y. And I think its range isn't as impressive as a Model Y. I'd have to look at that again. No, it was like 320 or something. It wasn't very... I mean, well, it's it was around fine, the range of it. 315, 320. In that price bracket, it wasn't anything outstanding. It was just kind of standard. No. And the one that we saw also had the next, or not the next port, the uh, CCS port on it. And also that port door mm -hmm. was massive. So yeah, it was it's close I, to Blazer. It moreover, seeing the two and three in person and exploring it with you only made me a little bit more excited, excited, excited about the six, which is my favorite vehicle <laughs> in their whole entire lineup. Yes, me too. Because that's actually in its own segment. It's not some bleed over between two segments. It's just like... I think when Polestar just goes all in on a specific vehicle segment and doesn't try to blend two different ones, they do mm -hmm. a really good job. And right, the three and four are a little confusing, but the yeah, the six and the five I'm most interested in. Yeah, and the path that they've taken is also a bit strange. Starting with a a three and then going to a X. And then a Y, yeah. and then a three X Y S. That's S, the order. And then Roadster, <laughs> <laughs> and then the Roadster last. I guess they have that in common. But well, I guess starting with the hybrid as well. But I don't think too many people talk yeah. about the Polestar one. It's mainly they started uh, with the Chevy Volt. <laughs> right. It would be interesting to check one of those out at some point. Just see where their roots began, and yeah, how it was a soft launch from Volvo pretty much mm -hmm. taking what the, I think, S70 was and then turning it into their own kind of take on it with still a lot of Volvo uh, inspiration. But I, I could be wrong, but I think the Polestar 1 is one of the few, if not only, hybrids that has DC fast charging capability. Mm -hmm. All the rest are just, you know, level two, so you can slow charge them for daily driving but Polestar was like no we want it to be gas powered but you can also quickly recharge it if you need to it was interesting interesting yeah that's definitely the word for it <laughs> <laughs> a lot of interesting decisions but yeah I I just I I don't know what the demand looks like maybe they got a ton of buyers lined up for them but I would be most hyped. I don't, I'm sure the Polestar 6 is going to be super expensive, but I still want someone in the EV market should just make, you know, an electric ver version, not the same exact thing, but an electric version of like a Mustang or a Camaro or a Corvette. That's not a crossover. It's just like small, but quick and speedy, but also meant to be relatively affordable. Yeah. I'm still waiting for the fun. day that Miata actually comes to their sense, or Miata, Mazda comes mm. to their senses and makes a Miata EV. It'd be perfect. Oh, that would be cool. It I'd doesn't like to need to be super powerful. It doesn't need to no. have a bunch of range. It doesn't need... Just make it super lightweight Yeah. so you don't need a crazy motor to get it to go fast, you know? Like, no, <laughs> you don't need that a big thing battery. for being fun and zippy. It doesn't, yes. it doesn't need to be the performance vehicle. It needs to be the fun car to drive around town and just have a great time on some mountain roads. Yeah. Someone should make that. We've got all these variants of the same thing. <laughs> yeah. I would like to see them mix it up a bit. I think some of the apprehension is sedans don't sell well these days. So crossovers are pretty much the bread and butter. And that's why in like 50 years, people are going to look back and just see Crossover SUV, crossover SUV, crossover SUV for days. And they're going to yep. ask, what were you guys thinking? <laughs> it just turns out, well. This is all we could this do. This is all we this wanted. Is all everybody wanted. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Insane. Oh, well. 
Well, do you have time? To- what do we have time for? Should we wrap up or what do you think? I think as maybe something that I wanted to mention mm-hmm. is pretty much polydrop. Polydrop? No. <laughs> Back to polydrop <laughs> with Doc Moore. <laughs> Look at it. It's beautiful. Polydrop is cool. I think we should save that for another podcast <laughs> right. where uh, we're really That's diving into the day. ERVs. But I think we're we're in an interesting part of EV history where some of these startups are swimming mm-hmm. and definitely some of them are having a lot of struggle just trying to keep afloat. Oh, very much. Yeah. And Most companies like Polestar, even though they're supported by... Uh, uh, legacy auto company it'll be interesting to see how they step up their production and the models that they offer and how that compares to what rivian is doing and what uh i guess one that i i, I am a little bit apprehensive of talking about because we haven't seen much is uh oh goodness what was the name of them it was uh <laughs> thinking of it it's on the top to my tongue scout scout uh, I don't know if I've heard of them. Scout is, I believe, uh, they're supported by Volkswagen. It's a sub-brand of Volkswagen. And they're supposed to be an all-purpose, all-electric lineup of vehicles. Mm. And I believe they're coming out, or they're going to announce two of their models sometime this summer. And, oh, is uh, it like retro? It's like retro futurism. Of Interesting. Something that is EV no, have but more rugged. Read more into this. Yeah, I don't yeah. think they're supposed to be the most aerodynamic looking things. It's no, what, it's no. meant to be <laughs> VW's answer to things like the Jeep uh, Wrangler, or yeah, uh, what's another good one like the oh uh, the Ford Bronco maybe. Right. Yeah. But more of like the definitely Ford Bronco nostalgic, Ford. but. <laughs> I'm I'm guarantee you that will result in not great specs, but that's not what they're going for. So that's okay. No. So that's something that I, at least for the summer, that's why I'm looking forward to is something okay. like uh, what Polestar is to Volvo is mm-hmm. what Scout Motors is to VW and how those two approaches go because Polestar definitely went all in on a little bit more luxury, a little bit more bespoke design, but mm-hmm. still offering the uh, the commuter esque look to uh, a product that is still striking. Where Scout Agreed. is going to be a little bit more adventurous, mm. and it's going to have some of that Rivian, uh, not architecture, but that R- Rivian language in there. Mm-hmm. We're, we're m- making this for fun. We're not making this for. Uh, getting a sale because we want you to buy our version of the Chevy Blazer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's probably worth rethinking, you know, this is Polestar at the moment. <laughs> oh, for their stock right now. And uh 92% it, in I think that's years. the same for that's a lot right. of companies, a lot of EVs. I mean, we've been burnt by Canoe, so <laughs> Yeah, it's We're just all funny how them. even though they're backed by Legacy Auto, it doesn't change the fact that it's still really hard <laughs> to make, to bring value and to, you know, report good numbers. So it's worth rethinking the strategy. Right. Fair enough. All right. Well, we'll catch you all uh, hopefully in the not too distant future. Let us know any changes. We're still experimenting with the new setup and stuff, but how do we do? <laughs> <laughs> and we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye.